Psalm 72 is a song of Solomon, the first of two in the Psalter, and it is the final psalm in Book 2. And uh, that's significant. Uh, This is a coronation prayer, the type of prayer that would have been used at a coronation, an anointing ceremony, as the king was installed to lead. Uh, As such, it's classified as a royal psalm or a psalm of kingship, and it corresponds in many ways to Psalm 2. You ought to pull out Psalm 2 and read these side by side, because Psalm 2 comes at the beginning of Book 1, Psalm Psalm 72 at the end of Book 2. And it's pretty clear that the editor of the Psalms wanted those two to frame Books 1 and 2. The Books 1 and 2 fit together. We'll see that here at the end of the psalm in particular. Uh, Because it's a royal psalm, it's also by nature messianic. Um, Messianic simply means anointed. That's the root uh, meaning there of the word Messiah in Hebrew is anointed. So it's referring to the king as the anointed of God. And so when we read this psalm, we can't help but, but think of Jesus, the Messiah. When we think of Solomon, we think of how Jesus said of himself, one greater than Solomon is here. Uh, as Jesus referred to himself as one greater than Solomon. Uh, So think of this as a coronation prayer, a celebration of Solomon and other Judaic kings that would follow him. Solomon's prayer is that he would receive from God justice and righteousness, that he would be the bestower of the blessings of God's justice and righteousness to the people. He would be that conduit, that representative of God's justice and righteousness on earth. May the king judge your people, and judge there has even a broader sense of provide justice uh, to lead in a, in a fair way, and provide specifically your poor with justice. There's that, I love the phrase, your poor, God's poor. Uh, the poor have a special place in God's heart, and they should in the heart of the king as well. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people. The mountains and the hills and righteousness. So it's describing the flourishing of the land, the bounty of the mountains, the uh, the water that would flow down from those mountains, perhaps from the north, that would bring prosperity, uh, filling the Jordan River uh, with water to nurture the land. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy. So special concern that the king has for the poor and for children that's the restorative aspect of justice. And then there is the, the, uh, the punishment aspect of judge, justice, to crush the oppressor. Remember we said from the very beginning that God's justice has, has two sides to the coin. There is the restorative aspect that is a, a help and a defender of the poor and needy. And there's also a, a retributive aspect that pays back uh, harm to those who have done harm, the punishment, the uh, punitive aspect of it. Uh, may they fear you while the sun endures. That is, may the oppressors, may those who are unjust and evil, may they be afraid of you as long as the moon and the sun. May the king be like the rain that falls on the mown, gla- mown grass, like showers that water the earth in his days. May the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. Uh, so we have this uh, Uh, hyperbole, this picture of flourishing abundance uh, that the king might live uh, as long as the sun and the moon. So this is clearly hyperbole, uh, but the kind of thing you would want to pray for a great king, that his reign would endure forever. And if you want to summarize this prayer, it is for justice for the poor, prosperity for the people, justice for the oppressor, righteousness and peace abounding. That's the quality of the king's reign. Now the extent of the king's reign would be vast as well. May he have dominion from sea to sea, probably reference to the the, uh, Persian Gulf to the east and the Mediterranean Sea to the west. And then to parallel that from the river to the ends of the earth, uh, the river referring to the Euphrates most likely and the ends of the earth being kind of a catch-all for every direction from there. Uh, Of course, Solomon never... Uh, extended the borders of Israel to that extent. So this is hyperbole, but again, similar to what we saw in Psalm 2, that the ends of the earth would be the possession of the Messiah. Verse 9, may desert tribes bow down before him. So desert, we're thinking to the east and to the south. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands, so that's to the west, 
of Israel, the coast, and then the Tarshish to up into Asia Minor, or perhaps as far west as the uh, Iberian Peninsula and modern-day Spain. May they render him tribute. Uh, may the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. Uh, Sheba is probably reference to Arabia, Seba to Africa, so to the south. Uh, so we're covering all the directions of the earth geographically with Jerusalem as the center. Uh, may all kings fall down before him and all nations serve him. In fact, we know this was true of Solomon, that the queen of Sheba came and brought him gifts. And so Jesus uh, refers to this in Matthew 12 when he says, The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold something greater then Solomon is here. So the cities that uh, Jesus visited when he was on the earth, who rejected him, who did not believe in him, they will be condemned by this pagan queen of Sheba, who came to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Now we're back in verse 12, to the equality of the king's reign. He delivers the needy. This is echoes of the earlier part of this psalm. He cares for the poor, he has pity on the weak and the needy, saves the life of the needy from oppression and violence. He redeems them, for precious is their blood in his sight. Now, the uh, later Jewish tradition saw this psalm as a description of the Messiah, and so did the early church. Uh, They saw this golden age of Solomon, and they longed to see it uh, come once again, and so they looked for a Messiah. They expected a Messiah in what we call the first century. And so the early church saw Jesus as the fulfillment of this messianic Messiah, this great king, uh, around whom the nations would gather, bring gifts, would worship, and serve him. Uh, The gifts, of course, that the nations would bring would not be material goods, but people, uh, the most valuable thing on this earth, the souls of men and women. The psalm concludes with this prayer. May he live long. May gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer for him be made continually. Blessings invoked for him all day long. Uh, So may he have a long life. May there be abundance and prosperity. Uh, May the people blossom in the cities. So we have this beautiful picture of human flourishing under the reign of the Messiah. And then may people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. Uh, This, of course, is a fulfillment of the very first promise of blessing given to Abraham in chapter 12. Abraham would be a blessing to the nations. And we might recall Psalm 67 that invokes this a bit, as well as the priestly blessing in Psalm 67, that God would be gracious and make his face to shine upon us so that God's ways would be known among the nations. And so Psalm 72 then brings that to completion as Psalm 72 depicts for us a Messiah who would be a blessing to the nations, and that indeed is who Jesus is. This is a thread that runs throughout the entire uh, scriptures that God desires to bless the nations of the earth, and he does this through a person, through Abraham and his seed, and his seed then being David and then Solomon and then ultimately Jesus. We see this uh, spelled out for us in the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew. It begins by saying this is the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So this is the thread that runs through Scripture uh, that God desires to bless the nations through his Messiah. Well, the psalm comes to a conclusion with verse 17. Verses 18 and 19 are a doxology to the entire book, to book two. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. May his glorious name be forever. Uh, May the whole earth be filled with his glory. There's even that uh, messianic uh, expanse of his reign. And so this doxology signifies the end of book two, And then we have added, verse 20, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And so this concludes the the primary collection of Davidic Psalms. There will be some other Davidic Psalms sprinkled in the other books, uh, but the bulk of them are located here in the first two books of Psalms. So we're not completely finished with David yet, uh, just mostly. And uh, this Psalm, uh, of course corresponds to 
uh, an earlier Psalm of David. As we get to it here, we might recall as we review Book 2, Psalms 42 through 49, Sons of Korah Psalms that began with lament and moved to a wedding and then to a city. And uh, then we had a singular Psalm of Asaph calling us to repentance. And there we have verse 50, uh, Psalm 51, David's prayer of repentance. As you recall, that was because he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And uh, my point being here is that the Davidic prayers begin with Psalm 51, which is David's prayer of repentance following his adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon. And so this section begins with Psalm 51 and ends with Psalm 72, a prayer of Solomon, the son of David. We notice that David's prayer of repentance is followed by nine psalms of lament over his enemies that gradually move into psalms, four psalms of trust and then four psalms that are hymns for community worship. Then we move back to a cycle of lament that are increasingly focused on praise, trust, and personal testimony. And wrapping up with Psalm 72, Song of Solomon, a royal psalm that corresponds to the beginning of Book 1 and links uh, Books 1 and 2 together, uh, framing them with the glorious rule of the Messiah. And of course, both of those psalms pointed us very clearly to Jesus, the Messiah.